on this Sunday night. Extreme cold and piles of snow. A record-breaking winter storm slams into parts of Canada. It's probably the worst thing I've ever been through. So imagine being stuck on the tarmac in minus 30 degree weather for 16 hours. Why hundreds of passengers were grounded in Labrador. Outcry over this viral video, students taunting an Indigenous elder in D.C. Now the teen at the centre of the controversy says he's standing by his actions. If you don't win, and obviously I know you don't want to think that way, but will you stay on as leader? I will be the leader that leads uh, the New Democratic Party into the 2019 election. Tom Mulcair says you can't stay. What do you say to him? In depth with Jagmeet Singh, from pipelines to that crucial by-election and how he handles criticism, even from his own party. This is The National. Being Canadian means standing on guard to take the worst winter can dish out. But every winter storm is brutal in its own way. And tonight, parts of Canada face a range of conditions from difficult to dangerous. A storm system has already cut a frozen path across central Canada. The temperature in some places plunging below minus 20. But take Ottawa. Yesterday, it held the title of the coldest capital city in the world. Quite the honor. And it hasn't suffered this kind of a combination of cold and snow since 1895. The storm is tracking east now, with wild winds whipping up a vast amount of snow and sleet. Ainsley McClellan shows us the scope of the storm's impact. Howling winds, biting cold, and near whiteout conditions. None of it was enough to keep visitors to old Montreal from taking in the sights. For some, it was a chance to experience a real Montreal winter. We have to dress, dress up very well, but uh, it's the way it is. Ironically, the city's annual snow festival, La Fête des Neiges, was cancelled due to the snow. And there was a lot of it. About 25 centimeters fell. With the wind chill, it felt like minus 30. Further east on the Gaspé Peninsula, the snow piled up at 5 centimetres an hour, with a whopping 70 centimetres of snow expected by the end of Monday. The storm forced the closure of parts of the Trans-Canada Highway east of Quebec City. Quebec Provincial Police reported dozens of collisions across the province, but none with serious injuries. At Montreal's Trudeau Airport, thousands of passengers saw their flights delayed or cancelled, including those who had been hoping to leave winter behind them. We've been delayed four and a half hours. We're going to Martinique. It's just said delayed. delayed one o'clock. We're going to register, but <laughs> it is what it is. Northern New Brunswick could see up to 50 centimeters of snow, while other parts of Atlantic Canada are being hit with a nasty mix of freezing rain, ice pellets, and wind gusts up to 100 kilometers an hour. Enough to prompt many people to stock up on the essentials and some snacks to wait out the storm. I really don't know anything about storm chips. Thought they were wood chips for putting in the fireplace, but pleasantly surprised to find out that you eat them. In St. John, Oliver Carr was dreaming of warmer climes. The restaurant where the Jamaican-born chef works decided to close up shop because of the weather. What's going to my mind is, um, mommy, help. <laughs> you know, it's, it's beautiful, but at the same time, I wish I was in Jamaica on the beach. While the storm should start to peter out in Montreal overnight, Environment Canada says those in eastern Quebec and in Atlanta, Canada will have to brace themselves for more as they won't be rid of this massive winter system until tomorrow night. Ainsley McClellan, CBC News, Montreal. Okay, now this so-called Colorado low came from the U.S. Rockies. And on its way here to Canada, Americans too just had to deal with it. <laughs> So this was in a Boston suburb overnight. Police in a bizarre effort to enforce winter storm parking rules, blasting let it go from frozen on its drive-by. I'm guessing for a lot of people it's either very clever or very annoying. More than 1,500 flights were canceled across the country and in all there were winter storm warnings across 15 U.S. states. It's the kind of weather that just makes you wish you were somewhere else. Like Hong Kong, where the average January temperature is, get this, a pleasant 18 degrees. Compare that to Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador, where overnight it dropped to almost 30 below. But that's exa exactly where 250 people spent a frozen Saturday night and a big chunk of today stuck on the tarmac inside a broken plane with little heat during an extreme cold snap.
They've now finally been flown home. But as Renee Filipponi reports, warming up after all that might not be so easy. So it's coming up on, I think, about 15, 16 hours now. Sanjay Dutt used social media to update the world outside the plane, but the lack of answers from United Airlines made the situation that much more painful. I've been flying weekly for the last 20 years now, and this is probably the worst thing I've ever been through. The plane took off from Newark, New Jersey at about 3 p.m. Saturday, bound for Hong Kong, but was diverted to Happy Valley Goose Bay with an onboard medical emergency. That passenger was taken to hospital. But then, a mechanical problem with the door grounded the plane. By midnight, technicians gave up trying to fix it. And passengers were told they'd have to spend the night on board because no customs officers were available to process them. And that meant most passengers spent more than 16 hours in the plane in frigid conditions, though a few were taken off. At one point, there were fears they would run out of food, but eventually crew on the ground delivered Tim Hortons. And by this afternoon, a relief plane finally arrived and took passengers back to Newark to try and salvage their travel plans. It sucked. You know, it's just like, especially because I have a lot of brand loyalty to, to United, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, I fly nothing but United. I, I, I don't fly any other airline. And, and, you know, I fly every week for work. And that's what I've been doing for the last almost 20 years. And, you know, I make it a point to always give my business to United and for them to kind of drop the ball like this, uh, you know, it, it's disheartening. Yeah, Renee, definitely sounds like it would have uh, sucked. So uh, what are we hearing from United about all of this? Well, United says it has done everything it could, but as you heard, passengers have their own opinions about that. Now, we've heard from a number of people who landed back in Newark late tonight who say they were handed envelopes, but they didn't seem to all get the same thing. Some got $100 gift cards, others up to $500, and others still got some hotel vouchers. But, Andrew, the U.S. Department of Transportation, it's important to remember, does not require airlines to offer compensation for delayed or canceled flights. Okay, thanks very much, Renee. You're welcome. It's a rosy, brutal story. Uh, you ever been stuck in a plane for anywhere near that long? No, you? No, uh, stuck overnight in an airport, but, sure. but it was warm, right? Yeah, so yeah, nothing touch wood, touch wood. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, let's head south of the border if we could. So a day before Martin Luther King Day and Americans are, are struggling with a, a racially charged moment. Yeah, Andrew, and as these things happen uh, these days, it was captured on video. A smiling white teenager wearing a Make America Great Again hat seemed to mock uh, an indigenous elder who is drumming and singing. The boy's school has since apologized for the group's behavior, but as Paul Hunter tells us, today the boy says he was actually trying to defuse the situation. It is an unsettling scene. On the steps of the Lincoln Memorial Friday, an indigenous elder, Nathan Phillips, at the end of a march in Washington for indigenous rights, and a high school student from Kentucky who stood staring and smiling while those behind him laugh and chant, some waving their arms up and down in what's derisively known as a tomahawk chop. And those red ball caps with Donald Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again, a term which for many in this country has come to symbolize resurgent racial intolerance. What did Nathan Phillips feel? Fear, not for myself, but fear for the next generations, fear where this country is going. In our country right now, in the United States, there is a racially charged atmosphere. Chase Iron Eyes, an indigenous activist from North Dakota who was at the memorial as it all unfolded, blames the divisive language of Donald Trump. Any objective, reasonable mind is going to, to, to be able to interpret that he's giving license to some of this behavior. Tonight, in a statement, the student said a group of religious demonstrators had been taunting them, so they chanted to drown them out. He says the indigenous elder then, separately, singled him out, and the smile was simply to show he wasn't angry. Initially, when I first watched it, I felt heartbroken. Victoria's Nikki Sanchez, who fights for indigenous rights in British Columbia, was a featured speaker at the March Friday. She saw the episode online. In her view, it highlights all the work still to be done. Sadly, I think for many indigenous people, this clip was not shocking. This clip was not something new. This clip was a representation of the attitudes and behaviors that we experience as Indigenous people on a daily basis. The students eventually turned and walked away. In Kentucky, 
their school apologized for what they'd done. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Along with that apology, the school and the local diocese say they will take appropriate action up to and including student expulsions. This is Dale Hawk. He's trying to piece together how his late father could have wired his life savings offshore to a scammer without his bank stopping him in his tracks. The bank ought to have protected him, he says. But the bank says there were no critical red flags. Erica Johnson has this go public investigation. They just asked for $3,000. Dale Hogg is talking to scammers who tricked his father into sending his life savings to Malaysia. After his wife died, Robert Hogg went on an online dating site. Within weeks, he met someone who claimed to live nearby, said she was out of the country on business. Sophia Goldstein was actually the face of scammers who convinced her target to wire money to Malaysia over and over. Uh, October 12th. 50,000, October 24th, 50,000. Hogg's family discovered the wire transfers after his father died of cancer in September. They added up to over $730,000. It was a sick feeling for, for, you know, quite a few days. That sickness turned to anger when he realized his father used his longtime bank branch to send 19 different wire transfers over eight months, each time to a different person. It's frustrating. I mean, there should have been red flags going all up all over the place at the bank. TD declined an interview request. In a statement, a spokesperson said, our employees followed rigorous processes, including asking detailed questions at each transaction. The bank says their customer claimed he was building a house in Malaysia, says his story was consistent. The Canadian Bankers Association says banks must strike a balance between preventing fraud and protecting customers' rights to access their money. More people reported losing money in a romance scam than to any other fraud last year, almost $25 million, up from $17 million in 2016. Banks want to be the keepers of our money. And as such, I think they have a moral and ethical obligation when you're dealing with seniors to make sure that they provide due diligence on the accounts. Hogg is considering a lawsuit. Meantime, the scammers are unaware his father died. Their $3,000 request has now increased to 5000 Yeah, there we go. He's stringing them along, hoping one day they can be found and prosecuted. Boy, okay, so Erica, we know romance scams are a big issue. What processes do the banks have in place to try to figure out when their customers are being duped like this? Well, it turns out that there are no national standards or requirements for banks or financial institutions. Uh, all of them have them, of course, but they're, they're not having to meet any sort of bar there. Uh, what they do have to do, though, is if someone is transferring more than $10,000 offshore, that has to be reported federally. But the purpose of that is just to look to make sure it's not money laundering or possible terrorist financing. It's not to try to catch a consumer who's being victimized by fraud. Okay, so then short of, I mean, any legislative change, uh, given how many people are turning to online dating, what are just some basic tips to protect yourself? Well, there are a few things you can do. If you're online and you're talking to someone that you've never met in person, be wary if they start professing their love to you too quickly. Also be cautious of moving off a social media site to email or text. Don't share personal information too soon, like your birth date or your address. Uh, be suspicious if the person claims they live nearby but are on a trip overseas. And of course, never send money to anyone for any reason, any, any person that you don't know. No, just never do it. And of course, the, the best thing you can do as an adult child of an older parent is talk to them about their finances and even possibly their love interests just to make sure that they're not being victimized. Right. Okay. Good advice. Thanks, Erica. Thank you. And remember, our Go Public stories come from you. So if you have a tip for Erica and the team, you can send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. School bus safety will be on the agenda tomorrow when the federal minister of transportation meets with his provincial counterparts in Montreal. Some people think the discussion is long overdue. After the deadly crash of the Humboldt Broncos team bus last April, the federal government ordered that new coach buses will have to have seatbelts by September 2020. But what about school buses? An investigation by the Fifth Estate has thrown new light on your children's safety. And the CBC's Karen Pauls looks at what might happen next. 
Okay, come on up. This scene plays out every day at schools across Canada. The vast majority of bus trips go just fine, but then there are tragedies, like the one in Alberta a decade ago that killed Donna Noble's daughter. I put Jenny on the bus to school that morning. By the time I got to work, she was gone. She believes Jenny would have survived if she'd been buckled in. You hope that somebody would have learned from Jenny's incident, but evidently it doesn't seem to matter. For years, Transport Canada used a 1984 study to argue against the use of seatbelts on school buses, saying they're not only unhelpful, they may also cause injuries. But last fall, the Fifth Estate exposed serious problems with that study and its conclusions. This problem needs to be fixed now. I have instructed my department to take an in-depth look at the question of seat belts in buses. The federal transport minister promised action. We'll try to do it as quickly as possible. Three months later, Petra McGowan wants to know what's taking so long. Hi, how are you <laughs> Her daughter Emerson spends an hour and a half on the bus every day. Definitely happy to have her home, safe, sound. She's always worried why bus drivers are the only ones buckled up. So she started a group called Manitoba Parents for Mandatory Seatbelts, calling for school buses to be retrofitted. Several unions have already objected, saying they don't want drivers held responsible for keeping kids buckled in. I feel that we do have the data, we do have the uh, research studies that are showing clearly that seatbelts save lives. McGowan and others are asking Canadians to sign a petition. They'll present it to Mark Garneau, hoping to keep the pressure on. I think it affects any parent because kids go on school outings, right, and it also affects lots of uh, sports teams that use school buses. Garneau says he'll get input from his provincial counterparts at a meeting in Montreal this week, and he's signaling an announcement could be imminent. We're ready for this, and we're going to act as quickly as possible. For me, it's an urgent uh, project. Provincial ministers we spoke to say they're waiting to take their lead from Ottawa. They'll have to enforce whatever Mark Garneau announces, something that could happen as early as tomorrow. Karen Pauls, CBC News, St. Anne, Manitoba. Here's a look at some of the other developing stories we are watching tonight on The National. Canada is condemning an attack that killed 10 UN peacekeepers in northern Mali. The victims were soldiers from Chad. Assailants linked to Al-Qaeda attacked their base. Ottawa says no Canadians were killed or injured. It was a very significant attempt to kill people here in this community. A car bomb went off last night in Northern Ireland. No one was hurt. Police have arrested four men and are investigating whether a group called, quote, the new IRA is responsible. The attack comes amidst warnings of potential violence following Brexit and a day before Theresa May has to deliver her plan B for that plan. Just two days after he was in a high-profile crash, Prince Philip has been spotted driving without a seatbelt. Police say suitable words of advice have been given to the driver. That driver, who is 97, was only bruised in Thursday's crash, but a woman in the other vehicle broke her wrist. Ahead tonight on The National, she says she wants to give away her $1.7 million home, and all you have to do is pull in her heartstrings. We'll explain in tonight's moment. Interesting. First, though, a Nova Scotia teenager opens up about being viciously attacked. Why it's prompting calls to change the law in this country. And a little later, the Sunday interview with NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. We talk about whether he'll keep the job if he doesn't win his seat in the upcoming by-election and how he's adjusting to federal politics. Did that surprise you when, when people sort of called you out for maybe not being as well briefed as you should be for this job? Well, on, on the idea of uh, receiving criticism or, or feedback yeah. on that, I mean, I can take that. A Nova Scotia teenager is struggling to cope after a horrifying attack earlier this month. Police have charged five people with multiple offenses, including assault and unlawful confinement. But the girl and her family say what she went through was torture. And as Kayla Hounsel reports, her story is renewing calls to change Canada's criminal code. But first, a warning. You're going to hear some disturbing details. It was uh, non-stop, like... For hours, I... We have concealed her identity because she is a minor. 
17 years old. Her ordeal began when someone she thought was a friend picked her up to go for a drive. There were others hiding in the car. They were telling me they were going to break my legs and leave me there. Accusing her of stealing, she says they beat her entire body. She can't say the rest herself, so she defers to her aunt. Her face was almost unrecognizable. As the young women drove her to various locations around the town of Yarmouth in southwestern Nova Scotia, the beating continued. She says they dragged her to the car by her hair, tried to get a dog to attack her, and pulled off her fingernails. When they tore off her fingernails, her fake fingernails, it actually removed her real fingernail underneath. Then they went to the home of a 64-year-old woman who is also accused of participating. They held her head back and they were pouring water all over her face and down her throat because they were threatening to drown her. Five people have been charged in this case with offenses including aggravated assault, assault with a weapon, unlawful confinement, and uttering threats causing bodily harm. But two Nova Scotia activists say there's something missing. We know of cases where they've been told that they weren't allowed to say torture in the courtroom, even though that's what they endured. I mean, For the last 25 years, Linda McDonald and Jean Sarson have been helping victims of torture and traveling the world speaking about it, including at the United Nations. They don't want to minimize assault, but say torture is a different kind of trauma. They've been lobbying the Canadian government to include non-state torture in the criminal code. They say it's not about the punishment, but about validating survivors. So if we don't have a law and if a person isn't allowed to denounce the people for what they've done to them, the perpetrators, then it's like dismissing really what happened to you. The Justice Department declined an interview, but in a statement, a spokesperson says there are already several crimes in the criminal code that prohibit violence against a person in the private sphere. He goes on to say creating a separate offense for private, non-state torture could have negative impacts on Canada's contribution to the international effort to prevent torture by creating two definitions. I just want to be able to feel safe. This young girl says regardless of what the law says, she feels she was tortured. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Up next on The National, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. We talk pipelines, his political priorities, and his future in his own party if he doesn't win a seat. The Sunday interview is next. First, though, we covered some lighter topics. The same questions I asked the Prime Minister a month ago. Take a look. What job would you do if you weren't doing this? Ooh, um, well, for a long time, I was, uh, I was really into martial arts, and I, I had a chance to compete. In, in a professional sense, I could have gone down that path. Like so the UFC or something? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, like I, I could have, I could have pursued basically a career in in martial arts, and that would have been really cool. Music, podcasts, any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Ever since Drake ended the, the beef, and now I can listen to Meek Mill. So, <laughs> so his his album actually has a lot of really cool uh, social justice undertones. Yeah. So he talks about prison reform and justice reform, but also has really catchy lyrics and beats. Yeah. Do we believe in celebrating all diversity? When Jagmeet Singh was running to lead the New Democrats, he confidently and carefully took on an angry heckler. We welcome you. We welcome you. Giving Canadians a glimpse of the savvy politician he might be. Less than two months later, he became leader of the NDP and was seen as a fresh, charismatic voice, one that could possibly rival Justin Trudeau for that young, progressive appeal. But in the 16 months or so since then, it's been a bumpy ride. Tell us whether or not your caucus is behind you in supporting this bill. Uh, at this point, that's, I'm, I'm, you know, just give me a moment, I'm absolutely clarify. So yes, right now our caucus is in support of this bill. Singh has struggled to find his place on the national stage, and though born in Ontario, he chose to run for a seat out west in Burnaby South. Hey, how's it going? He's now busy trying to win what many are calling a do or die by election on February 25th. And with just nine months until a federal election, he also needs to prepare to lead an entire party. One that's had at least eight MPs either resign or announce they're not running again. Hey, how's it going? I met up with Jagmeet Singh earlier this week in Burnaby. 
has the job been harder than you anticipated? Well, I knew it was going to be a tough job. I knew that uh, getting into this role, it, would be, it wouldn't be an easy walk. I had a bit of training as deputy leader in Ontario, seeing the work that Andrea did as, mm -hmm. as the leader. And I knew that there was a significant gap between being a deputy leader and being leader. And then the, the heightened uh, intensity of being a national leader. Yes. So I knew that it was going to be difficult. What, what do you say to people who say that there have been times where it seems that you've been unprepared? I'm going to, you know, that famous geek out all moment where you're <laughs> like, oh, I don't know. Um, and there have been a couple other moments like that. Did you maybe not realize the preparation it was going to take that you really have to do a lot of homework when you want to be a federal leader? Well, well I know that it's, it takes a little time to do preparation. I mean, throughout my life, uh, all of my studies have required lots of prep. I mean, I was uh, a defense lawyer for a number mm -hmm. of years, so it takes a lot of work to prep for cases. So there's a lot of work involved in, in everything that people do. And it's a learning curve, and there's things that I'm going to improve on, and I, I look forward to those opportunities to improve. But did that surprise you when, when people sort of called you out for maybe not being as well briefed as you should be for this job? Well, on, on the idea of uh, receiving criticism or, or feedback yeah. on that, I mean, I can take that. Like I, I know it comes with the territory, it comes with being a national leader, and, and that's okay. Um, at one point it was reported you weren't making any money because the party is having some issues and so you said, I'm not gonna take a salary. Has mm -hmm. that changed? No, I'm not taking a paycheck from, from the party. Are you taking a paycheck from anywhere? Uh, no, I've got uh, some support from my family. Uh, I've got support from friends. Uh, I'm doing all right. I've got a lot of resources and, and a lot of people that, that help me out and support me. So let's talk about how the party is struggling a bit financially. People say it takes maybe 40 million bucks to run a campaign. I mean, you're a far cry from that. We've got uh, <laughs> challenges, of course, but we're seeing a positive upswing and okay. we're going to see more and more of that. We're seeing people that are, are let down on things like uh, commitments to the environment and to reducing our our emissions and to tackling climate change who are not feeling that there's there's you know a liberal party that's actually connecting with them or a conservative that care about this oh. concern and they're looking at us as uh, as a leaders on this file I want you all to know that I intend to run in the upcoming by-election here in Burnaby South did you choose the riding to take advantage of your pipeline position I chose the riding because there's a lot of passion in this riding on the environment and people want to see us use our public dollars to invest in the green energy of the future and clean, green, renewable jobs yeah. that are available and a sustainable economy. So yeah. there's a lot of support for that position. People. But the pipeline too. You, you knew that you were, you'd come out against it and you knew this is like the epicenter of that debate. So well, you, you knew that was going to give you an advantage, certainly. Well, I know that uh, I've taken a position on that. Yeah. But broader than that, people are concerned about the, the pipeline, but they're actually even more so concerned about what we're doing as a nation and how we're spending our public resources. That's what I've heard at the door again and again. People want to see us commit to a transition to a, a greener economy where we actually create great jobs and supports for communities that don't have those jobs and also reduce our emissions. And that's a really big thing. I hear that across the ride. If you don't win, and obviously I know you don't want to think that way, but will you stay on as leader? Are you committed to that? Yeah, I will be the leader that leads uh, the New Democratic Party into the 2019 election. I'm confident we're going to do well in this riding. Tom Mulcair says he can't stay. What do you say to him? What I'm concerned is uh, not about my future. I've never been concerned about my own future. I'm concerned about the future of this country. And the future of this country will depend on having a strong, support or voice in the corner of people saying, hey, we need to have medication coverage for all. We need to make sure we invest in housing. There's got to be a better way. Are you surprised that Tom Mulcair feels the need to comment on what you're doing so often? I mean, uh, that, that's not what I'm hearing at the doors. I knock you know, no, he's hundreds doing, he's of doors. He's doing a lot of backseat driving. Yeah, I mean, I, I knock on doors every day. This is my job right now. I'm, I'm hearing people, and that is not what they're concerned about. They're concerned about, they're not saying no, but I'm not asking what the, what the people of, at the doors are saying. I'm asking you. I'm asking, but that's what I'm worried about. No, right? I, that's, like, that's, that's fine, that's but I'm asking concern. you. You see the, the former leader of the party who got dumped uh, talking and criticizing things that you've said and the, your position going forward. That doesn't, that doesn't bother you, or you don't think that that's strange? Well, again, I'm, I really am focused on I, how do I help people? And, and that's not something that I'm hearing at the doors. Like that type of criticism is not relevant to what he what says. People, you're not hearing at the doors. That's not what people are talking yeah. about. You and know, you don't care. Are, you don't care that he's saying that. that. Yeah, people can, you know, raise concerns if they want. I'm worried about what what people who are struggling are telling me and how I can make their lives better. Mulcair, well, he won 44 seats in the last election. Tom Mulcair, and he was pushed out. So what what's 
what do you have to win then? Because that was decent. It was a decent. It was a decent performance, and he couldn't keep its job. Well, for me, I mean, I'm looking at my performance and how can we make people's lives better. Like that's my me metric. What can we do to advance the the conditions that people are living in right now? I know, but that's but that's not the metric that the party has used in the past. The metric is performance based. It's not mm -hmm. whether they, people are listening to you talk about issues that I agree are important. So how do you deal with a party who has previously said 44 seats isn't good enough? You're out. Yeah, my metric is going to be how we make people's lives better, and that's what I'm going to focus in on. I mean, okay. I, I can't predict the outcome. I no, can no, predict, I know that, but you, you, I can you, predict you, the outcome you have, in terms you, of the work we put in. No, I can but you talk have, about you have what we're going to raise as concerns. Sure, but you have evidence of a party that is impatient when you don't do well. So, it, I think it's a legitimate question to say if you don't do that well, are you concerned about what the reaction might be? No, I'm not. I'm not concerned again about myself. I mean, that's not never been my concern. I got into this gig. Uh, in a riding that had never voted NDP in okay. the history of the country. Yeah. So I didn't get in this gig because I was worried about that. I, I got into this role, this important role, because I want to use the platform that I have to advance a better country. Better. Okay, you want to talk about some issues, so, and I do too. So let's yeah, yeah. start with the pipeline. Sure. How would you get more oil to market, or would you? In our country right now, we've got two failed processes that this government has continued to use. One is the environmental regulation process is failed. And it's proven to have failed because the courts have found that it failed. Sure, so but they, have, they, have, since, they have since revised it. And they've come up with a new process for there, pipelines going forward. There's some so serious, they've recognized that. Yeah, there's some serious concerns. And we pointed those out. And the court supported our concerns. Secondly, Yes, and that's why they've gone back and they're doing further consultations. Well, now here's right? a second concern. Yeah. Well, here's a second concern. On their further consultations, they've already prejudged the outcome. This government has said, we are going to build this pipeline no matter what. Now. That does not really bode well if we want to respect indigenous communities, if we want to really follow through on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We can't start off saying, we're going to meaningful consult you, but we've already prejudged the outcome. Okay, that is not you, on. Are you, so saying the those United, are, are you saying the United Nations Declaration gives indigenous communities in this country a veto over those projects? I'm saying that we cannot proceed forward with any project in this country unless we uh, obtain free prior and informed consent unless we have buy-in and partnership. Reconciliation requires hard work sure. and it requires respect. It doesn't mean we can say that we're going to build something, but then we're going to go out and then consult afterwards. Right. It means accepting that a project may not go ahead. You are, though, undoubtedly aware uh, of the Supreme Court decision when it came to what a federal government is allowed to do with these kinds of lands. And it says, when adequate con consultation has occurred, a development can proceed without the consent of an Indigenous group. It is only the Crown's duty to consult and act honorably. It is not the Crown's duty to say, you're right, we're wrong. They are arguing that this is in the national interest. This pipeline is critical. So how do you, how do you reconcile those things? Well, reconciliation requires us to go beyond that. It requires us to re-examine the way we've done things. We've got to actually what be does that committed mean, to- What does that mean? Well, we've got to be committed to doing more than just checking off a box. That's not enough. That's not actually going to be reconciliation. If you just go say, well, look, I've done this and I've done this. I've checked off a box. That's right. not meaningful reconciliation. But so then what, what should they be doing right now that they're not doing? Be open to know. I mean, the communities that are impacted, the lands, the sovereign nations that are impacted may not accept that this is a project that they want to support. And that is something that the government has to be prepared to accept. Our public dollars should not be spent on a project that the private sector does not see any profitability. That does not make sense for us to use our public dollars to well, do that. Well, the private sector we, didn't see profitability because it was caught up in the courts and they were worried that it would just be endless, which is a legitimate concern. The, the private sector pulled out the public, the public dollars, the Canadians' dollars should be spent on investing in our country in a sustainable way for the future. But are you then suggesting that we're going to get off oil in a 24-hour period? I mean, th there are... I'm actually making a clear suggestion. I'm saying that with our public dollars, we should be investing in the green economy of the future. So that we should have just and let that pipeline go? It's, with our public dollars, it should not, be, should not have gone towards that. Yeah, absolutely. So, I've then, made what, my position so then what clear. do you say to all the, the oil workers in They Alberta? need help. It's not their fault that they're in a sector that's subject to bust and booms. They're, they're in a sector that's so unpredictable. They deserve a lot better. They deserve us to invest immediately and aggressively in a future where they have sustainable jobs, right, but not that, just for the next couple of years, no, but for the long term. But that transition, that takes time.
time, and it, you ha you have to move in that direction over time. It sounds to me like you're saying, well, too bad, you know, you guys are out of luck because this sector is becoming antiquated. We don't want to be using oil anymore. I mean, that that's a fair position, but is that what you're saying that well, we shouldn't be investing in the oil sector anymore? Let's let's be clear. Uh, there is a resource sector in Canada that is going to continue, uh, but I'm saying with our public dollars. We'd be doing a disservice as a country if we didn't say, hey, we acknowledge the unpredictability that these folks are going through. These people are going through hardship. They just want to be able to work and, and earn a good living for their family. Let's invest our public dollars into something that will be long-lasting and sustainable and not subject to the same volatility. Okay, uh, let's talk about the other part of that, and that's climate change. The United Nations says that most large emitting countries are not going to meet their targets, their Paris targets, including mm -hmm. Canada, um, even though that's the Prime Minister and the Environment Minister seem to think that we will. I'm not sure how. And so that's not going to happen, even though the government has various plans in place to reduce emissions and a carbon tax that's going to take effect. So what would you do more of uh, to try and get us to the Paris targets? Well, first of all, we need better emissions targets. Uh, secondly, Tougher the Tougher emissions targets? Is that what you're talking about? We do. We need better emissions targets. Right now, the emissions targets are still essentially targets that are uh, Harper era targets, targets that, again, like as you noted and as we all know, will not get us to the Paris Accord uh, target levels. But more importantly... I know, but we're not even going to meet those, so you want to make it harder. We should make our levels more ambitious, absolutely. Okay. But what we need to do is, if you look at the current approach this government's taken to the carbon tax, they're putting the burden on everyday families instead of the biggest polluters. The biggest polluters in our country are essentially exempt. We've got coal-based burning, coal-based energy plants in New Brunswick that will be exempt um, almost 90%. So the current well, at the approach is, at the beginning. But the Changes current approach this government has mm -hmm. taken is effectively the biggest polluters are getting a, a free ride and everyday families are going to have to shoulder the burden. That is a very skewed approach. On uh, China, there's a Canadian right now who's been convicted by a Chinese <clears throat> court to, uh, to a death sentence for alleged drug smuggling. How would you deal with a situation like that if you were prime minister? You've got a country where we seem to be in this terrible diplomatic retaliatory mm. actions, well they do, uh, while we're trying to do things uh, by due process, and they keep escalating things. What should the government be doing in that instance? Uh, just a for first, first moment, we've got to just think about what that family is going through right now. Like that is just horrible, the, the fear that the family must be facing right now. So what we need to see happen is we've got to stand up to China, we have to be ready to stand up to, to anyone that we need what to stand up to. What does that mean, to. though, stand up well, to China? We've got to say, listen, uh, what you're doing is, is just wrong. Mm -hmm. you, you can't take individual people and use them as political pawns, uh, detain people without due process, um, revise... But that's essentially what the Prime Minister did the other day, and then the Chinese government basically told him to shut up. Well, and we, we, can't, <laughs> stop, we can't stop raising concerns. Yeah. Canadians expect that... that we take care of Canadian citizens. And right now we've got Canadians that are being detained and they don't know the reason why. They're not being afforded due process. Mm -hmm. They don't have access to lawyers. Mm -hmm. They don't know the charges against them. No. I mean, these are basic things that we should demand. I, I covered the NDP for a long, long time. <laughs> um, and, and there was a shift at one point with Jack Layton where uh, he decided he wasn't going to, you know, just say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can mm -hmm. in the election. Mm -hmm. um, he said he, he would start every speech by saying, I'm going to be prime minister. Mm -hmm. What is your goal in an election? Is it to do the things you've said for people, get issues on the table? Is it to win more seats? Is it that you really want to do that job, to be prime minister? Absolutely. I want to be prime minister. Because That's I the want goal to, during the election. I you want to say make, that to people. I want to be prime minister yeah. because I want to make people's lives better. Right. And my paramount goal is to make people's lives better, is to improve our country on all fronts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Rosie, pretty wide-ranging interview. You cover a lot of ground there. I'm curious to know, though, if, if there was something in particular that, that stuck out with you uh, about that conversation. Well, first of all, we did not coordinate outfits, even though I know that's what people will suspect. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I mean, to do an interview while you are uh, campaigning for a by-election is always a little bit risky, because he's got to really win that by-election. It is critical. But I think the other thing w was, and, and he did admit this during the interview, is that it's been a steep learning curve. He only became an elected MPP in 2011 and he is now the leader of a federal party all those jobs are pretty different and he's had to do them all very quickly and i think he recognizes that and uh he's he's had a taste of it maybe more often than he would like well and the uh, the federal election coming up late 
this year in October. That's right. That's right. Okay, up next on The National, we will take a closer look at how podcasts are breathing new life into the old art of radio dramas. Why companies are betting big on podcast fiction. But first, a preview of a series of stories that we'll have uh, this coming week on The National. Everyone cares about this. How much sleep do you get every night? Not a lot. Canadians are getting less and less. And tomorrow, Duncan McHugh will explore how that could have a serious impact on our health. All right, come on in, Duncan. Okay. This is how it begins. My journey into the world of sleep to understand why we can't do without it. 60% of Canadians don't get the sleep that they need or the sleep that they want. It's quite a big number. Yeah. That's, that's a huge number, that the, over half of us are, are not getting as much sleep as we want. That's right. That's Fogel is halfway through a four-year research project um, uncovering connections between sleep and memory. And a lot of what sleep is good for has to do with memory. People are really gaining a lot of interest in this uh, because there seems to be so much about sleep. The more we, we do study this, the more we find how there's uh, just so many aspects of sleep that are involved in memory processing. The subpoena will not be quashed. This is madness. You may think of radio dramas as relics from another time. In decades past, they were a popular CBC staple and a springboard for actors looking to make it big. But these days, you could say they're seeing something of a rebirth. Now, we know podcasts mostly for nonfiction, news, true stories, and the like. But fiction is potentially the next big frontier. Tashana Reed takes us behind the scenes. It's not their usual stage. My sister's taken to talking to me. She's dead. For these actors, today's performance is all about what you hear. So this time we'll try it together so that it's all together, but then we might just do a couple different versions of it. What a Young Wife Ought to Know is one of five Canadian plays to be reworked solely for audio and the CBC podcast Play Me. After 20 years of working in theatre, Chris Tolley and Laura Mullen wanted to reach new audiences. Our podcast audience is young and diverse, and I feel like it's exciting to think that by, by podcasting, we might be bringing in people back to an actual live theatre experience. Okay, that's great. There's so also the opportunity to get the work of Canadian writers out there. We have 60% of our writers are women, 60% of our writers are people of colour. And for us that's really important because our, our audience is international. Yeah, that's me. That's a good one. Award-winning playwright Hannah Moscovich welcomes the chance to breathe new life into her play. There's something so intimate about it, like voices just speaking right to you, into, the, into, your, into your ear, that I really like. All right, both of you, get our guy back here. I'll give covering fire. Got it. Go, go, go! For Moscovich, fictional podcasts are reviving the art of the radio drama. For five years, she wrote for CBC's last radio drama, Afghanida. And I loved the intimacy of radio drama, and uh, I loved writing for it. I'm happy that it's coming back in this way, and then I get to work in it again. And it's not just plays. Scripted dramas are starting to make ripples in the vast podcast pool currently dominated by nonfiction shows. Fiction really is our big bet for, like, groundbreaking new content that doesn't sound like anything else. <laughs> Only four years old, New York-based podcasting company Gimlet Media has had big success. Gimlet's original fictional thriller, Homecoming, was a hit with listeners and led to a TV adaptation starring Julia Roberts. The way you'd want to sit down and watch a movie or get super engrossed in a television show, that is how um, our fiction team really thinks about the projects that we take on. How many more people are about to die in this room? Their latest offering, The Horror of Dolores Roach, has off-Broadway roots, and the podcaster is busy adapting a popular young adult novel. From the script to podcast is still an investment. Sourcing talent, writers, even creating original sound effects costs money, but worth it, say creators, if it means more people will press play. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Our moment is next on The National. An Alberta woman is holding a writing contest, and the winner gets to keep her home. It's worth about $1.7 million. 
I want it to be someone that's going to enjoy this place and is going to uh, uh, love being here and, and, and fit in with the neighborhood. So an Alberta woman has to downsize, but she wasn't getting offers for her home southwest of Calgary. So now she says she'll give it away to the person who writes the most compelling letter explaining why they deserve it. There's a $25 entry fee, but if you win, you get a home that's said to be worth well over $1.5, $1.7 million. Her emotional sales pitch is our moment of the day. Not to wake up and see all this is going to be so difficult, but I really want to be real. Last year, I fell off a chair in the office and I hurt my back and now I'm completely limited to upstairs. I even joke, I'm like a Rapunzel uh, stuck in a tower. I can't go downstairs. <laughs> so this is not a lottery. This is not a random choice. It is a creative writing uh, contest. So, and, but there is an entry fee. It has to just really touch on my heartstrings, not necessarily because of a sad story, but because of the motivation. Yeah. It's not somebody that's going to win the place and just flip it. Wow. Just so you know, it's up for grabs though, because as you can tell, it's a big house, 5,000 square feet, three bedrooms. There must be very big bedrooms. Mm -hmm. There's a piano room and there's a wine cellar. I saw pictures of it. It's very extensive. Is, is that what you're going to be writing about in your <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Yeah. Well, and, and just before I guess everyone gets their hopes up, she says that there is a minimum number of entries that she requires for the contest to actually uh, go ahead. So, you know, she's not accidentally going to give her house away for free and, and she does expect to get something approaching market value. But uh, there you go. And she says she'll refund the entries if she doesn't hit that magic number, but, but I suppose people can dream, right? It's novel, it's novel. <laughs> That's the national for this January uh, 20th. Have a good night. Good night.